actions are being looked forward by all the bid and proposal manager community, not only just the APMP members, but a lot of non-members also. For the non-members, I would like to tell them that there are many other resources available from different parts or different uh, chapters of APMP Global, which they can attend and uh, they, can, they can surely get a lot of value by joining the APMP India chapter, because if you join the APMP chapter, yeah, uh, India chapter, you get uh, access to all the APMP global chapters and the webinars there, not only on the APMP conducted webinars. So every there's a lot of resources available. So without taking much time, and uh, just uh, another thing uh, add to add to what Rupesh said is that your feedback is very critical and important for us. So please do provide a free and open feedback to us. And this time for, we have all also decided that the feedback uh, based on your feedback, those who submit the feedback forms, uh, we would be sharing with them a much more detailed presentation prepared by our today's uh, guest and uh, uh, Shashi uh, on proposal writing. So please, if you want to get that detailed uh, presentation with uh, lots of tips and tricks, uh, tools for proposal writing, please complete the feedback form and share the feedback form after the completion of this uh, webinar. So without taking any more, much more time, uh, let me introduce uh, our guest today. Our guest today is uh, Shashi Kokar, who is an AVP with uh, a content uh, strategy for Genpack, which is a leading global ITS company. Everybody knows about Genpack. Uh, Shashi, leads the content strategy at uh, Genpact and she's responsible for the entire content management with for not, not only related to bid and proposals, but also other uh, related areas of content. So she is uh, the person to go for every bid manager when they need any content or for any anybody in the organization when they need to go for content. Uh, she has been into a lot of things. I know she has been into knowledge management she has been into editing and uh, she has also been into training so she comes with a multifaceted uh, skill set uh, related to writing and academically she is an mphil in english uh, in, in the english language other than that uh, what i know which is not there on her linkedin profile and you may not know is that she is also a author and a poetess she love yeah, if you are following her on linkedin you would see her uh, blogs uh, which are so uh, empathetic and show uh, shows the human side of her uh, apart from the bid side bid and proposal management side so she has that human side she is a social worker she has been participating in a lot of social act she has been doing a lot of social activities so with that a very warm welcome to you shashi and we hope we will have a great session here and as we have decided that uh, we would be keeping it uh, more like a free form uh, fireside chat with, of course, a uh, web uh, presentation being done by you and more in a, to make it more interactive. And so please feel free participants to uh, ask your questions. I will be looking into the question and answer, uh, uh, questions and answers being posted and I will be asking them to Shashi. But to start with, uh, this is my first question for you, Shashi is that what is the prerequisite of a good proposal? We, everybody wants a good proposal. Everybody wants to write a good proposal, but what are the prerequisites for it? So first and foremost, uh, thank you Abhijit and uh, for the very warm welcome and the kind introduction. And I hope first and foremost, all, everyone is doing safe. This is a bit tri tricky time for here, us in India. So, uh, you know, hope everyone keeping safe there. And uh, now before we go to this uh, aspect of the prerequisite of a good proposal, I think uh, it's important we first understand, you know, what exactly is the issue when we talk about all of us deal, we are not new to the space, right? What exactly is the issue that really leads to us losing proposals? And I know all of us will be quick to jump uh, with that one thing, pricing, of course, uh, you know, and there's an interesting uh, nugget around the price, pricing. While we believe, uh, one third of the sellers believe that actually it is the price could actually be leading to losses, 
right? There's an interesting uh, fact there that if you were to really look at it, price is only five to 10% uh, of the decision-making process. Decision-making uh, people are only five to 10%. The, all of that remaining people are value, looking for value. So certainly why we look to actually put it on uh, you know, price, actually the reason why we do not really win proposals is because we don't qualify right. Uh, we don't have adequate, while of course we say that it's a given, but we don't have adequate knowledge of the uh, client, their industry, and most importantly, we do not answer their questions, right? And I think this may sound very simple. These are not, I'm sure these are not things you're hearing for the first time, right? But the issue here is why is it that we really miss out on, uh, on that and what do we need to do about it? So I think the first process, first thing that we actually really, and this isn't really about writing, uh, we need to, as an organization, if we are really dealing with proposals, Right. I think the first step is, are we qualifying our prospects correctly? Right. Or do we really have the capability right, for us to be able to do it? Second, are we really invested in the relationship? Uh, any, while it really looks like it's a proposal, but it is all about the relationship. And here it is, if a seller is approaching you only at the time of a sale, right? There isn't any depth. All that a person is going to be relying on is what's mentioned in your RFP. And that's not certainly not a good place to be. So the knowledge and information about your challenge and prior, of course, the relationship with your client, and then, uh, you know, a really in-depth understanding of what exactly are their hot buttons, what's keeping them awake, right? And at this point in time, what is really their immediate provocation for this RFP, right? And that is something not one person, not the seller, not the solution, but the entire team, the bid team has to be aware of it, right? What exactly are they, what are we really, what are we solving for? Who is the competition, right? Uh, very often this is the missing piece. We forget that bids are, bids are competitive. Right, we talk about it. We talk about the winning and losing, but when it comes to writing and you know including the right nuggets, there we forget that, right? And therefore, if it is competition and if you evaluate it correctly, what exactly are your differentiators? How, if these are the people, these are your landscape. This is the landscape in which you're operating. How would you, your capabilities, really differentiate when, especially when? Uh, you know, the, when a person is going to sit down and evaluate, but the selection committee is evaluating it. And then really, what is the compelling value proposition? The WIFIM for your client. What's in it for me, right? That is core. Now, all of these points, I'm sure Abhijit, and I think those of us who are listening, I think these aren't anything new that I'm talking about. It isn't about the what, it's more about the how. Right? How well do we really do that? That's the question. I think you addressed uh, it very uh, succinctly, Sashi, and very pointedly. Yes, this is something everybody knows, and the challenge is the how. So, the, my next question is that once we have the prerequisite, when does this proposal writing process begin? And what we have seen is generally that. Most of the proposal managers, they start structuring the uh, proposals by preparing the proposal template as soon as they receive the RFP. Maybe prepare a RFP summary or a brief summary, distribute it across the organization, and thus start preparing the proposal template on the structure. Because that's that looks like to be the first job to be done. Now, is that a recommended way? So... Uh... Good question, Abhijit. And, uh, you know, I know, I think uh, whenever we are talking proposal, it's a fire drill, right? And I think, uh, you know, as soon as we get the proposal, we are actually fighting against time, really, how do we put this together and actually send it across, right? Uh, but the idea is for us to be able to just do, just not do that. Uh, it is important for us to pause. And I think uh, that's why typically when I chose this particular theme, when I said, is proposal writing an art or a science, right? There is a big part of the art here. And I'd like to bring in that, uh, you know, aspect here. You know, you have to liken a proposal to, a, you know, a work of art. 
You take a sculpture, you would take a wooden artifact or a painting, right? The medium can be different, but each piece is unique, right? And art is never created en masse. You don't really have a factory production of art and that's why it's valuable, right? And if we, yeah, so, and therefore, if we were to really look at a proposal with that lens, right? Uh, just as we do the art part of it, right? Typically, what will an artist do? And if you were to actually talk to some of the artists, right? Most of us struggle with what do I paint? Right, what's my vision? What should I really, you know, and how do I really bring that vision to life? In this case, it's uh, in the case of a proposal, they, this becomes slightly easy. You, the, pro, the client is actually thought of the problem and they are trying to solve for something. But the question is, do you really know that, right? And have you tackled it right, right? So the, the idea for us to be able to really actually, and that's the starting point for all of us, is that while we are actually tempted, go back to the, and I'm a person who runs the library, and I can actually very easy ad, easily advocate, but I would never say that begin with a boilerplate, right? At least till the time, you know, you've read your RFP, you've understood, you've, you've brainstormed it, and you've created a wireframe. Create that narrative, tell a story, and for that story has to be created fresh each time. It cannot be repurposed, and it should not be repurposed, right? So create that story. Once you have created the story, starting with your client challenges, you show your understanding of, you know, that you understand them, their pain points, their industry, right? And then how you solve for it and so on and so forth, right? Once you have done that, that's when you start plugging in what is readily available with you in the library. Am I making sense? Great, definitely. And this is one thing which I wanted to add uh, here and for the, all, for the audience also, that uh, like language has got two components, the syntax and the semantics. Similarly, the same holds true for a proposal also. It has got its semantics and it has got its syntax. Absolutely. What we are discussing today is the semantics part of it, the structure part of it, structural part of it. And this webinar is going to be in two sessions. In the next session, again with Sashi, we will be discussing the syntactical part of it. That is basically the content, the writing part of it. Today, we will be focusing more on the structure of it. So that brings me to the third question, like now that we have come to the structure of the proposal. And we all know that every proposal needs to have a structure. Now, how will you define the scope and purpose of the structure? And how can the proposal manager add value to the process of creating or extending the proposal structure, even if the client has provided a generic structure? Because the generic structure has gone to every competitor and their cousins. How as a proposal manager with that structure, still using your creativity, you can create a differentiator, you can create a winning proposal. And that's where I want to ask you your experience and how do you do that? So again, Abhijit, uh, to it, uh, you know, we've, all of us have tried to decode this at some point in, in time or the other, but I'm actually kind of continue, going to continue with the theme that I started off, which is basically us telling a compelling story, right? Now, if we are to tell a compelling story and let's, uh, let's accept the fact all of us love stories. That's not children, we didn't, we, that's not something once upon a time long back, still mm -hmm. stories. Right, and uh, let's look at it from a point of view. If I were to give be given a 500, 400 pages by someone thrown at your, you, and you have to read through it, it's painful, right? And someone has to do that job. Now, if we were to look at it from that perspective alone, and let's say I have to create an interesting narrative, so every story has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? And each of these, right, has a distinct purpose the beginning, the middle, and the end, okay? Now, in the context, let's place it in the context of a proposal, okay? What are you exactly trying to do in the beginning? You're doing, doing nothing. You are simply creating a resonance, building trust, giving them a sense, we, hey, it's okay for you to trust us, right? We understand you. We understand your problems, right? Your problems and challenges are paramount to us. We are not here to just sell. 
Okay, and we are committed to solving your problem. Okay, and then we are talking about the middle part. Now, this is your meat of the pro uh, of your proposal, and often I think most of us focus our problem and attention here. That's the bulk of the proposal. Nothing wrong there. The only little problem is that this section cannot be a section on capability. You're not selling your organization. You're not selling your capability. You have to link it to the problem, right? So you've got to say how your problem, how exactly are your solutions, right? Helping them solve their problem, okay? And then of course, in the end, you know, we're just about to reinforce, just the way we said, you know, you're building trust in the beginning. In the end, you are talking about, you know, ensuring and committing that if you really put our put your uh, you know problem in our hands you are safe right we we understand your risk and we'll do the best uh, to make, make sure that this uh, you know your uh, your it actually gets executed well okay and this i just put it a very simplified structure and i think i know many of us will be thinking in terms of how do we really do this and that's the part we get into next okay now we said uh, the beginning is actually uh, the creating of the hook, right? I can lose it immediately after the beginning. I will not read it any further. So really, how do I really create the hook? So the important element first is, you know, star, it's a has to be a sharp articulation of your, of their unique challenges. And a very interesting factor here is that do remember there are many other vendors like yourself will be articulating this. So it cannot be an academic exercise, a Google co copy paste, right? Applies to everyone. It has to really show their under, show their language, show that resonance with them, right? Next, and the same thing, show the resonance, uh, you know, that you understand their space, right? Have a, you know, give them a feeling that you understand that space so much better than them. And if not, at least better than them, at least as much as them. Right, and there and the challenges that are there within their value chain, right? Their hot buttons, right? What could really be those pain points, right? That they are really struggling with, and that really creates the aha moment. Ah, yes, they understand me, right? So you got to make those one or two things that have to be there, which are just unique. Just speak to them, right? And this has to be distilled through the multiple conversations. Uh, through the you know RFPs and often what's not said, right? So the interviews with your sellers, right, are critical, uh, you know, for you to be able to like peel the onion, what, 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 and why, 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 and I think that perhaps will help you create a very very strong uh, beginning, right? And most importantly, the beginning has to create a sense of uh, you know FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. Uh, it isn't really okay not to act. Uh, you know, there are other people out there who will really, you know, uh, you're, you're in a competitive space and you'll miss out. So that's your beginning. Right? Let's move to the middle part. Now, this one isn't really about, like I said, about our capability, my capability. I, me, myself, and some more of me that's not what it is, right? It isn't a sales pitch that we are making, right? I am solving for your problem. And that has to keep coming through all the time. And, and more importantly, as a writer, as a bid manager, and in, as the entire deal team, we have to keep reminding ourselves, each other of this. Where is that question? Where are we answering? Where are we solving their problems, right? So I think uh, the important part is that you make sure, first and foremost, you've taken a comprehensive view of what they're asking for. And many a time there are nuances. There are some things which are explicitly placed and there are some things that are implied. Do make sure that those, those aspects have been really covered, right? So for example, uh, aspects like, you know, if it was an incumbent, right? Why exactly, what has really propelled this change? Uh, what, may, what made them really look into this? And if it is something that, you know, so things like this will actually bring in the nuance, right? And most importantly, I have emphasized enough, right? That we have to be able to link customers' needs to the benefits. You got to be not talking about your features, our capabilities, but what does it really mean for them? 
each time, you know, once you've had the capability, question that, how does it relate to this client? This client in the specific geography dealing with this problem, how does it solve for that? Uh, Abhishek, how do we really go about, I do see some questions coming in, do we take them towards the end? Yeah, we can take them towards the end, no issues. And uh, participants, please uh, ask your questions in the question answers tab. Uh, in the chat tab, it may get lost in the uh, chat which you are having. So please put your questions in the q and tab. You will see it on the right corner of your bar, Zoom bar. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, okay, great. So, and then we come to the end. Uh, typically the end has to have, you know, meaning we said the purpose is for us to be able to convince, right? That here, what we are trying to say is that you're, they have to be by now, they have to be convinced the problem has been solved. And, they, and you are the right person to be able to solve that problem. So now here you've got to tell them how is it that you will solve the problem and just have a detailed roadmap, right? With specific details, uh, you know, around timelines, around people, give as many details as possible, right? Of course, you need to call out any assumptions, risks and dependencies, but be very cautious about it. Now, this one is a really big, big, uh, you know, uh, what should I say, a, uh, uh, a catch. Right. If in the end you have pages and pages of assumptions, risks, and dependencies, right? There is something you are telling me. I don't want to take ownership. I am being defensive. I am not very confident doing this. So I am giving you all possible assumptions, risks, and dependencies. So be smart about it. Right. Yes, of course, add it. You've got to be protecting yourselves. You've got to tell them that certain, you know, success will come through only when these aspects are met but make sure that those aspects are really, really, you know, very well defined. And most importantly, in the end, don't introduce new elements. You are closing it. Now don't pop in, don't put in new questions into their head where they start thinking, oh yeah, that wasn't there in the solution. And that would be, you know, like, uh, you know, murder or maybe suicide for yourself. So don't do that. So before I move on and uh, so Abhijit, any, any, any reactions, any, Questions? Uh, well, uh, there is a question uh, which is coming from Aditya that uh, at times we do not have enough opportunities to interact with the customers. So what are the ways uh, to understand the implicit requirement? And it's a very valid question and a very a very pertinent question. We, every proposal manager gets to have, have this question and, uh, most of the time, most of the yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. So Aditya is the person who asked, right? Aditya. Right, yeah. Okay, Aditya, yes, you're absolutely right. And this isn't, uh, this is a struggle we all go through. Two, three ways in which we can do. And I think uh, one of course is that uh, easiest way is Google search for the industry, at least have a, a high level in, uh, you know, view of the industry, right? Do a little bit of the research, do a little bit of the, uh, you know, understanding in terms of how the company is doing, right? What are their immediate concerns? Are they partnering with someone? Are they, meaning some of those basic things. Right. But the simplest way to do is, and I think uh, we, what we hesitate to do is please go back to your seller. It's one team that he is the starting, he or she is the starting point. Go back and ask them if they don't have that, uh, they don't have the answer, ask them for it. So yes, we cannot connect directly with your, with the, uh, you know, customer, but there is a whole ecosystem, right. Which really supports us. And rather than actually beating about the bush, Right. Uh, clarification questions is, of course, an opportunity. But even otherwise, I think there may be if you feel that the seller already could have the information, please, please, please ask the seller. Do not hesitate. Right. That's a very important point, uh, Shashi. And one thing which I have uh, used or basically works for me in some ways is uh, putting that investigative journalist as and like, like a walking like an investigative journalist, uh, looking into the blogs, looking into the articles. LinkedIn is a great source to identify some of the implicit needs. And, uh, and again, make Google work. Set a Google alert for, uh, with your questions. And if there is something, uh, Google research, Google research for you and give you the answers. So I think those things have worked for me very well in my professional career. And I do suggest them also that uh, try to... Uh, investigate, do the research from your side and that uh, be little proactive and do the research, you will get the answers. If not all, at least many of them, you will get the answers. 
so we can move ahead now sashi yeah and in fact just just before we move on abhijit and i think uh, while we actually uh, you know ignore or tend to ignore the rfp thinking like it's like i have read it you know you'll be it'll be actually you know just if we really go through the if we really read the rfp okay it actually tells a story by itself you know if you really question why are they asking you for something right why are they why question that and then actually you can target your research basis that right when they are putting the pain point when they give you the landscape when they present your situation when they present their challenges right question yourself why could they be asking this what's compelling them right that gives you leads for what you can research on i'll just in the interest of time i'll just move on okay before we get yes any other question before i move to the other part abhijit uh well uh yeah uh before we move to the other part i will request uh, rupesh to run the polls rupesh you can run the two polls subsequent one by one uh, 30 seconds each that will give uh, some uh, time for to soak her through to sashi also so rupesh you can run the polls right now yes i have done polls you can yeah thank you please answer to these questions uh, this will help us in understanding that's a great thing that 81% agree that uh, strongly agree that proposals are a competitive advantage for the business absolutely absolutely we can run the second poll rupesh well that's a great thing to see that yes a uh, lot of people are self trained in proposal writing and yes uh, companies are uh, taking uh, taking proposal writing as a part of their lnd program and they have a uh, lot of uh, companies so basically if you see 50 per, yeah nearly 50% of the companies have either have people have either received formal training through their company or by other means so yes proposal writing is getting recognized as a skill within the industry which is a very good sign to see so before we move to the next uh, question uh, uh, shashi and and we talked about this like you you said like like uh, you said that every proposal has a story so you have to stab a story with the proposal so and we also i say uh, agree that actually every rfp also has its own story so if you go back to the procurement and ask that what is the story behind this rfp or how is this or how did this rfp come out or how was this not yet there in the market and who all are now a part of this story there is a lot of information and you very rightly say that the sellers so if you actually help your client facing team whether it's your sales team or your account manager uh, in in their proposal uh, in the, in asking these questions actually you will your life becomes much more easier you have got much more insights so yes that's a very critical point to keep a regular uh, interaction you know, with your sales teams or client facing teams or those who are nearer to the client now we said that every proposal has to have a structure and most of the times we know that this structure is defined uh, by the client but then within the client's 
structure somehow we try to retrofit our content into that structure and when we try to retrofit that content into that structure somewhere that structure loses its shape okay because client has asked for your governance methodology now your governance methodology may have five different sub methodologies involved into it and you either you and you do not know whether i should put only the abstract of the governance methodology here or should i put all the uh, all the gover all the me sub methodologies or component methodologies of governance methodology over here now in such a situation basically what happens is that the structure the proposal loses its structure and what where does it lead to the proposal evaluator gets lost in finding what exactly he is looking for okay so how do you make your proposal structure evaluator friendly make it more empathetic make it compelling enough to find the right information the relevant information instead of him or her reading through each and every word to find what he needs so basically how can we create uh, evaluator friendly or eva how can we talk about the proposal experience of an evaluator what's your thought on that abhijit a uh, very very good question here again and i think here is where we have the science we have till now been talking about the art right and we said the heart and the understanding of the client what they are looking for but here it is all about science right and that's where uh, you know pro right, proposal writing is very different from any other form of writing uh, that this is one place where it actually breaks it it's pure 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 mathematics there's a scoring that's involved right uh, and here therefore it is extremely extremely important that you know we ask ourselves the really important questions about right how is the customer going to evaluate the rfp right how will they read it right how most importantly how will they score it right what are the kind of weightages uh, you know that will be given to different uh, pieces now that has to be really your foundation and for starting us as a starting point and then of course we you know we all know about you create a, com a compliance list right most importantly what we do is we capture the explicit things that are mentioned uh we miss out on the you know the you know implicit ones but do make sure you capturing those as well while of course you know you will not really uh you know capture them on the that compliance table but do you know you just make sure that there is a checklist of sorts where you address their concerns so for example if there's a concern around they are first time outsourcer they have concerns they would be rebadging okay they have concerns about their people right make sure that has been addressed in all parts not only hr it has to be addressed in governance it has to be addressed in the way you solution in the way you transition every aspect has to make sure that those things that aspect has been addressed right uh then i think uh, it is you know around of course the quant i think the the core of it is basically about us my not so it is basically creation of a compliance list right most importantly show why you are the best alternative against each of them right what exactly is your differentiator that's where we started and the, these differentiators then actually should become parts of your heading because whenever people are skimming through remember proposals are skimmed through they are never read in one right so make sure that your headings and subheadings tell that story right and they tell and those have definitely been you know rooted very heavily and deeply into their challenges and your solutions for them right and that i think you know and that's why why the customer should select you right uh, and then the wifim what is it and how it benefit from all of that right up front the value proposition on some of if it's a slide which whether it's a word document just make that story come through right even when they skim through you know oh there is i need to know value proposition of this okay how will they make it real i need to know more about it so those are some of the tricks and trade uh, tricks and tips of the trade that you know we all need to really do and uh, while we had this interesting poll and i was thinking to myself it's been 10 years for me in this space and uh, you know if i were to go back to my first year i don't think i knew all of this uh, 
you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe about five years back, I knew all about it, but I still didn't know how to do it. Do I know it now? Even if, you know, I'm talking about it, maybe 60%, right? If we all knew the what and how to translate into how and actually execute it, we would all build all proposals. Yes, great, absolutely, absolutely. So I think uh, we have a couple of questions here from the audience. So I think we should take those questions up now. Yeah, sure. So, uh, okay. So let me take this. Uh, this comes from uh, Joe Linwood Barnes. Uh, and he asks a question, which is basically, how do you deal with the central, with in quotes, powerful procurement-led RFP, which is clearly disconnected from the part of the business to which you are bidding to provide services? Now, that's a great question, but it is more related to proposal bid strategy rather yeah. than the proposal writing. Would you like to take it or you want me to answer that? Uh, I think you can take that up, Abhijit. And I okay. like elements of the writing part, of course. Okay. So, Joe, definitely these are cases, uh, there are certain situations where the business uh, is a, a sort of, uh, you are shielded from the business and you do not really know about uh, what exactly is driving the business uh, to look for those services, what are the problems. In that case, the safest way to play is to me go by the RFP's word they be as much as compliant to the RFP's requirement so that they cannot reject your proposal by any means and you score the highest. You have to look at the evaluation criteria. You have to look at the compliance. You have to look at every mandatory requirement and see to it that you are scoring the highest to be at least in the top three or top five which are which they are vendors whom they are going to shortlist and then once you are shortlisted that is your opportunity when you are going to go in front of the real business users and before that everything else have to be based on your past experience of similar clients similar domains similar service areas uh, service lines based on that i hope i have answered your question joe uh, we have another question coming from Venu Manohar. And uh, it's a quite a big question. So let me summarize it for you. Uh, who would be the best person to write a technical section or any technical section? A SME or a solution architect who has a expertise in technology or a person who is an expert in uh, the language and storytelling, or do we need both one after the other? Uh, how actually storytelling works while writing the core technical sections? Okay. That's a very, very interesting question. In fact, we were just dealing, we were working on a very, uh, you know, a major RFP, and we were just dealing with this, right? And so I think to that question, Venu, I think you, you've asked that question. And I would say it's all, okay? So the core of the, uh, the core has to come from the technical SME right it cannot be anyone else right because if it if any superficial if it there's any superficiality attached to it uh, you know uh, the client can see through it and it will really not seem like a solution right so that the 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 technical person provides understands it right and provides that uh, you know the response the lead solution architect is extremely important here because he or she then weaves it into the solution how that capability gets weaved into the core solution that we are talking about, right? And then there is an aspect of storytelling, right? How do we really then weave it? How do we tell that story that it is understood, right? You can actually fill it off and throw it off with so much jargon. And as a layman, I don't even follow what you're trying to say. So you may be the best in what you're trying to tell me, right? But if you make me feel like an idiot, uh, and sorry for that, but... I don't, I don't definitely, I'm not going to love you and I'm not going to come back to you for uh, business, right? I need to understand what you're proposing to me. I need to understand what you're selling to me, right? Uh, before I appreciate. So make sure that all the three elements are getting covered because the what and the how and make it meaningful for them uh, so that, you know, they, they are able to appreciate what, what you've said. And just to add to that, uh... 
Shashi, one thing I have felt is that proposal writing as a skill is not only essential for the proposal manager or the proposal uh, yes. writer. It is a skill across the organization for anyone and everyone who contributes to the proposal. You cannot edit a content and make it a, it, a make it uh, aligned and that to at the last moment when you uh, when you get a content just a day before the things are to be compiled you are getting the content even if you have the best proposal writer and the editor and you have a hundred pages in front of you you simply cannot do it you simply it is just impossible to do it you can only do a grammar check you can do some things while on the headings or on the headings within the content that's why it is very important that every person in the organization who contributes to a proposal needs to understand, needs to have the proposal writing skills. So the next question which we have again. Uh, is, sorry, uh, sorry, Abhijit, and I think since you bring that up and uh, that's a very interesting uh, element there, uh, you know, uh, and uh, it's related to the fire drill we have towards the end. And of course, you know, we are struggling and you're very right when you say that there's only time for basic edits right? No one can actually do justice to it. Uh, and I think one of the tips there is in where content writing and proposal writers can pay, uh, you know, uh, play a big role is you create frameworks and give it to the, your SME groups. So technical people do not typically deal with stories, but if you can actually give them a framework, right? And at the start of a deal, right? So for example, it is a multi-tower deal, right? With multiple people involved, right? But if we give a framework, right? And you have a structure laid out and people do a little bit of the fill in the blanks, right? You wouldn't go haywire, completely haywire. And at the end of it, when the bid manager, the proposal manager is combining all of it, you do not get 10 different ways in which each of the section is being told. Uh, right. you know? And so that perhaps a little bit of the planning, uh, you know, will really help. Okay. Uh, yeah. But uh, then I have a contradiction over here also, or maybe uh, something here is that by putting a framework uh, at one side, when we are saying to be the creative side, and the other side, we are putting the framework. So you are putting the restrictions around. So is it not contradicting each other? Not really. So, uh, you know, and I think that's, again, these are, these are actually the battles that we fight every day when we actually, within the, you know, and that's why it's at the heart and the science always, I think uh, we're juggling with it. Uh, but then I think, uh, you know, we, 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 we are actually trying to solve, we have an end outcome. We need to make sure that the, our proposal is compliant, is responsive, right? And at the same time, uh, you know, we have limited time, right? Now, how do we, within all of those conditions, how do we really make it work? So I think uh, from a creative point of view, yes, be creative, be innovative in terms of how the, your technical capability will tie to your solution. Be creative there, right? In terms of how you want to. So that space is there. But a, a structure like a beginning or a middle and an end, a simple little thing that, you know, you will need to start with a challenge. You will need to talk about right, how, that, how are you addressing that challenge? Right, and if you you think you've addressed it, right? Tell me why I should listen to you. Give me proof points. So simple, high level, uh, you know, structures like that. Perhaps you know, Abhijit is what I meant. You know, you're okay. not yeah. really yeah. So uh, we have another question coming up from Karan Sharma. Uh, again, this does not uh, lead to proposal writing. But if you want to attempt it, uh, how important is competitive intelligence pack for a pursuit? Well, extremely. extremely important. Extremely. You cannot, or else you are shooting in the you you are shooting only in the dark. You knowing who are all your enemies around you. Yes, yeah. So I think uh, Karan extremely, and I think this is often the weak part, right? Like we become so focused with our capability, and uh, you know, I think if uh, you know, if we were just really, uh, you know, we were the only people bidding, right? There isn't really need for a proposal then. Right. The, the difference is that because there is competition and there are more people capable, many more people, you know, who are as capable or more capable than you. And they, they, they'll be telling the same stories. Right. And therefore, competitive differentiation is, is an element you need to address in your proposal. 
uh, without which you're not really giving any food for thought for, uh, you know, even the best of the, you have the best pitch, you have the best relationship, but if you really, eventually, if you're not able to score, uh, be, score on that, uh, you will lose out. So yes, you've got to be actually making sure that this aspect is well covered. Well, Piyush Jain asked uh, a question, which I think you have answered in, in the session, uh, but yeah, maybe you can reiterate that that most of the time the response structure is given in the RFP that we need to follow. What do we do in that case? I, I think he means, uh, how do we be creative in that case? Yeah, so I think uh, it's, yeah, you know, when your client is giving you that, so one, I think the good tip is that, you know, that again, go back, why is the person asking for, uh, you know, why asking for this? What matters to them, right? And then within that, right, do at least make sure that you're logical. There is a method to the madness. You are consistent. You are being, you're answering the questions that they're asking you. You are being comprehensive. Now, this may seem like very, very uh, tactical matter of fact, but uh, of, or, uh, you pick up any RFP and do a little bit of a post-mortem and you see that, you know, we haven't done such a good job of it. Uh, you don't need a selection committee to throw your a proposal into a dustbin. You will do it yourself. <laughs> Most if, of the time. Uh, for me being harsh there, but yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the truth of the matter. Right. And one of the areas, uh, one of the things uh, which I try practically and works for me is to map the section with the evaluation criteria and the scoring criteria. If you see the scoring weightage and that particular section, is this section going to be a part of the evaluation criteria? Is how much scoring weightage does this have? So based on that, you can see okay what sort of... Uh, uh, innovation can you do over there? How can you make it more compelling and uniquely unique or differentiating from your competition? Okay, uh, another question comes in from Mahesh Nilkantan and he asks like in terms of bidding, there may be a point wherein the BTS assumptions from sponsor may not be feasible to implement. In this case, how do we put this message across in a subtle way and the best practice is to provide alternative solutions uh, which would be possible to implement. Yeah. Okay. So Mahesh, I think a great question there. And, uh, and I think again, uh, you know, this is something we, most of us are uncomfortable, you know, dealing with. And, uh, you know, we don't know. And what we try to do is we shy away from it. And I think we play around, we beat about the bush. And that's something exactly, uh, you know, we, what we shouldn't do. Uh, you know, take it upon yourself, right? Even for a small decision that you're going to be taking and uh, taking if when you're going to buy a product or a service, right? You know when the salesperson is, you know, fooling you around. He doesn't, he or she doesn't have the product or service for you. Do you think your, sell, your uh, you know, your uh, client doesn't know that? So I think, you know, if I would, and I think that's something I've always advocated is be upfront about it. And you're right when you should provide solution and the solution can be, you could partner with someone, right? You can actually, you know, so provide alternatives, right? But be upfront about it, right? Rather than actually take them on a, you know, whirlwind trip, uh, they'll be able to see through it. Uh, at least that's my, uh, my take on it. I think I, I, I would agree with that approach also. Uh, we have a next question from Bharat, and he says that uh, uh, although he has a valid point, uh, you, he agrees to the point that we should restrain from boilerplates, but still uh, till the time the story booting is done. But uh, one thing what he has been struggling with is to draw the line in terms of how much information is good enough to provide confidence to the reader. As a writer, we intend to words providing as much as information relevant we could, and I could be interested to know what's your approach to know that you have provided enough information as a response. Well, that's a very good question. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, rea it's a reality. It's a Absolutely. reality. Every yeah. it's every proposal writer's reality. Yeah. Sorry, Abhijit. Who was this question from? Bharat Joshi. Bharat. So Bharat, I think, uh, yes, you're talking about the reality. And I think uh, I'll actually go back to where we started, right? Begin with your client, right? And we keep saying that, uh, you know, but we often forget that part, uh, you know, and begin with the end in mind. In mind. 
right? The end in mind is that here you are not really, it's not about you at all. It is, it is on someone's behalf, someone's problem you are trying to solve, right? At each point in time, ask them, ask what is it, am I really solving for their problem? Right. So, uh, you know, right. So write ups and write ups of, uh, you know, on on, you know, your capability, all of your, uh, you know, jing bang about yourself may not really, uh, you know, may not really help. Uh, yet we are tempted to it, tempted about it. And therefore, at the end of in the proposal and therefore you need a proposal writer. Right. Who can be ruthless about it, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we never fall in love with our your own right. No, right. And uh, more often than not, and I'm actually telling you, I'm a poet, I'm a writer. It is so difficult. You come up with a beautiful <laughs> sentence, you come up with a beautiful paragraph, and when you have to, you know, flash thrash it, it's the most painful thing you've got to do. But if you really want to have your voice reached out to your, you know, end target audience, in this case, your client, okay, uh, you will definitely have to do that. In the case of, uh, you know, other form of creative writing, at least you have a person who is interested in whatever you're writing about, if it's nature, if whatever you're talking about, right? But here, it's a job for that person. Hmm. Make it easy for that person. The, per the person is not interested in doing that. He wants to watch a movie after that. He wants to go okay. on a trip. He wants to read out something, something that would be interesting. He or she would be interested in. So uh, definitely and most certainly be ruthless you know, take a cut and shot at editing and just say, you know, what is it, what's not needed and just, just chop it. And you'll be amazed at how much can be chopped off. Exactly. And that's exactly what I also suggest to my clients and teams I work with that other than the proposal writing, the more important skill is proposal editing. You have to, so you Absolutely. write once, but you edit five times. That's the, that's the actual real way to do it. Don't write it and think that it is done. Write it once and then edit it five times and you will really see the impact of your writing. Yeah. Uh, and when you edit that, you have to be objective about it. Yes. Yes. Uh, you have to be objective. Yeah. You have to keep the mind. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. You have to keep in mind that the reader wants to make a decision. How are you going to help him to make that decision? Okay. We have some questions uh, from Sovereign Chandra. And he says that going back to the seller or procurement is normally done by the sales team. Do we then ask the sales to do the same thing uh, or take thing in control from pre-sales? Many cases, it may not be possible. I think he's trying to say that how do you, uh, uh, how do you ask the questions? And if the sales team doesn't have the answers, can, they, can the pre-sales team reach out to the client and ask the questions? So uh, typically I would say no, uh, because uh, like we said that it isn't really about asking the question. And there are some messages when in each of our behaviors, we send out messages, right? And here, when you're talking about, you're pitching something about one team, great team, uh, you know, whatever that organization is. And here where you have a seller talking distinctly and a pre-sales talking, why would you need that? If seller is your relationship guy with that client, right? He or she is the, right? Let that person really be able to talk to that. And this is conversation cannot be a point in time conversation. A relationship is built over a period of time, right? It is not just about asking a question. It is being able to understand the nuances of that answer. So, uh, you know, typically I would have a seller who has an ongoing relationship with the client really understand why you need an answer or response to that and then have a chat, uh, you know, and sometimes these questions can be very uncomfortable, but that's how, and it should be the seller and the, because the seller has a relationship, he or she will be able to do a better job of it. Exactly, exactly. And that's the reason that why you should not be only responding or involved only after you receive the RFP, rather you have to get involved much before that with uh, during the opportunity planning phase or the capture planning phase. And that's where you actually get an opportunity to give to interact with the client. Yeah, if your organization follows the capture process or has a, has a defined capture process as a part of their BD, 
definitely you will have many of these answers uh, before you even start writing the proposal or after the RFP is released. Uh, we have a question from Sandeep Mishra who asked like, uh, how do we build a compelling case for our organization through our proposal when we do not have strong relationship with the company that any other competitors may have? Well, again, that's not related to uh, proposal writing, but I would yeah. say that why in the first place are you going to bid for it? So if you don't, you, you don't buy from people whom you cannot trust or you whom you do not know, and you only buy from people whom you can trust. If that holds true for you, that holds true for the customer also. So if you do not have any relationship, why is he going to even trust you? Unless you are offering something very compelling and, and very innovative uh, uh, for the customer. And then that's your story. Tell that story that how innovative you are or how, uh, how, uh, how differentiated you are or how unique you are from your all other competitors. Make that your story. Correct. So Abhichit, then I think I agree with you. That's a prerequisite, uh, you know, relationship. And that's where we started. So, uh, you know, never meaning while, of course, there's a submission attached to an RFP. It's not a point in time exercise. It's a relationship building exercise. And, exactly. you know, for like any other relationship, it will require investment, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, when you it's not really about just you winning an RFP. Uh, it, it is much more than that. And for that, I think, uh, you know, that relationship is your starting point. Yes, exactly. And that's what you exactly pointed out in the very first, that qualification is the first thing. Okay. Yes. You win only when you qualify it. Okay. Uh, I think we have a question from Shefali. Uh, she says, the structure that you shared, uh, isn't it more relevant to the executive summary? As proposal structure is defined by the RFP, we rarely have a flexibility in the executive summary. I think she's talking about the structure of the executive summary, how it should be or where it should be placed and how it should be. Okay, so uh, Shefali, I think you're right uh, because an executive summary is a smaller document. It is for it is easier for you to actually follow this narrative and have a you know beginning, a middle, and an end. And uh, however, having said that, there are proposals where you uh, you know and your story in the executive summary is not very different from your from your uh, you know the response document. Eventually, that is, it's the same story you're talking about. So there has to be the method to the madness. There has to be a replication. The only little thing that will differ is the details, right? And how much of the details are going, going in there, right? So for that, I think that's, uh, you know, the other question you need to ask is, what's the purpose of an executive summary and what's the purpose of a response document? Now, executive summary is typically for the C-suite, for your leadership, who are simply going to take a decision. Uh, you know, and therefore, uh, you know, that is a quick and uh, quick uh, summation of what really your, what are their, how you've understood it, what your solution is, and what's in it for them, right? But your response document, of course, because again, it takes into consideration aspects of evaluation, and therefore, it's structured many times uh, in a certain way by the, by the client, right? While you're following that, right, do remember, never forget the aspects of storytelling, if it beats your logic, right? If it defies your logic, trust me that it will defy anyone else's logic, right? So do make sure that it is actually going by simple common sense and, you know, logic and those little elements of the, you know, a beginning, a middle and an end are tying up, even if the structure is given to you by your client. Okay, I think we are nearing the time to end and we have one question. We can take one more question uh, unless sure. you want to extend it, uh, Sashi. No, I think we'll just keep it to that. I have a... I yeah, have... I, I, I know that because you are working yes. for... Uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we will send you the other questions which we are not addressing. Sure. Maybe sure. address over the mail. So. Yeah. Uh, this is a Vikshita. Uh, she asks, like, when we have a very tight turnaround time, how would we ensure that we still deliver quality proposals apart from just responding to the explicit RFP questions and ticking off the compliance list? What are some of the things that can make our proposal stand out? Great question. So I think, Vikshita, uh, just one word for that, good planning. Yes. So 
uh, very, very often what happens is we, you know, we think we're trying to save time. Uh, so we have an RFP, let's start responding to the answers, okay? And you don't realize a little bit of good planning in the beginning will save you all the time and rework and reiterate, uh, you know, in the end. So uh, yes, start with planning. Okay, make sure all of your, uh, you know, simple little things, you know, agreement on the key challenges, agreement on the win themes. Does everyone know about it? All of us are on the same page. What are the key messages in terms of win themes that need to be infused throughout the proposals? Make sure it has been dispersed to the entire deal team. All of us understand that, right? And that's when you actually then start responding to it. So you have, this becomes your checklist of sorts, right? And uh, a cheat sheet. Uh, and then you keep, uh, you know, you know, uh, adding that. And of course, uh, you know, once you've done that, you wouldn't go very far wrong. You may be not be very innovative. You may not be very creative, uh, you know, but at least you'll not go very wrong in terms of responsiveness, addressing your client need, right? And then of course, there's a layer of a simple check, never send out an RFP without uh, small little things, yeah? uh, never a spell check wrong client names, meaning those are basic hygiene stuff. And that's something I think I'll just cover in the end. And let's move to that. That takes us to that next question then. So I think, uh, you know, the four pause we make, uh, know all about it. Uh, and again, but it's important we reiterate, uh, we make it, you just do not make it all about you. Keep reminding yourself, it's not I, me, myself. It is not, you, you are not pleasing your boss here. You are not pleasing your CEO here, right? It is about the client. If you do it, you you make a win, and that's when you will actually, uh, you know, be a considered a pleasure. Of course, non-compliance is a big no. Okay, uh, we've already discussed about some of these aspects of overwhelming the selection. You know, I think someone asked the question: How much is enough? How much is enough? It is actually decided by the client needs. Understand the explicit and uh, you know implicit needs, and just provide them what they are asking for, right? leaving them clueless for God's sake, you know, well, we love and we love to show that, look, do you know that German? Do you know that heavy word? Do you know that English as much as I do? Mm -hmm. But if you make someone feel like an idiot, uh, you're not helping them. And uh, they aren't interested in, in you. They are just simply going to say, hey, you, you make me look bad. You make me think you're over smart. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do business with you, right? It's as simple. They hold the decision to your, uh, to that. Uh, sales speak. Uh, many of our pages, we fill it with, uh, you know, our capability, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, right? And uh, here you have to really, uh, you know, take, even if it's a copy, paste, just take that additional time to change it into what's in it for them. Little time spent on that. Copy, paste, save your time there, but then actually customize it a bit. Very, very important, right? Um, of course, typos, bad grammar, jargon, we can't avoid it. And we, sh we can't let it be, that's hygiene, right? Uh, and then of course your assumptions, disclaimers, requests for information, and I think too much of it. Now, you know, while we think that this is English, what happened if it, this is an error? You know, many a times I've had people arguing with me as well. Uh, it's a wrong English. I am not such a good English expert. The message is in there. Hello, but I didn't understand your message because it was so grammatically incorrect. I couldn't make sense of what you're trying to say to me, right? And for and then another big problem for those of them who are natives, their English is a native, you know, English is a native language for them. They are not going to understand many of our localizations, what we call as Indianisms or you know, uh, simple little. And we'll do it next time. I think next session. Mm -hmm. It's really you know a lot of fun when the way we write English revert back. Okay, and many <laughs> doing. Okay, but do remember you are you got to be understood. And therefore, it's not about grammar, but it is that you're not the, the person is not being able to understand you. If you look at it like that, I think you are pretty much done. Great. I think we are done. We too are done with that. And thank you so much, Shashi, for this was really engaging with the number of questions we had. And there's a lot of other questions which are which we have not answered. We will take them up in the uh, either through email or in our next session. But definitely, this was one of the most engaging sessions we had. Thank you so much, Shashi. And thank you, everyone, for your participation. And let me remind you that you will receive this uh, set of uh, slides in a much more detailed one, I think, with some ticks and trips from Shashi uh, once you complete the feedback form. So please do complete the feedback form. 
and we will submit we will uh, share the template this uh, entire proposal presentation with you all so thank you everyone have a nice weekend and please stay safe and take care of yourself and your family and we will see you in our next webinar next month thank you so much bye thanks abhishi thanks so much rupesh and thanks everyone i think this was an engaging uh, one and i think lots of food for thought and always a pleasure to actually talk to like minded people struggling with the same issues and i think there's always uh, you know food for thought so uh, look forward to um,